When we speak of God's grace, we often speak of the gifts he has given us, such as the gift of wisdom or courage. In the Catholic Church, it is believed that we receive these gifts through the presence of the Holy Spirit. But how are we to know what they are? And how do these gifts influence our lives as Christians? Welcome to Mysteries of the Church. I'm your host, Carolyn Morrison. Join us as we explore the gifts of the Spirit. The Catholic Church teaches the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, that God exists as three persons, all within one Godhead, God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. It is believed that the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to give us the desire and strength to live according to God's will. Too many people think that God is far away. And when you have a conception of the Holy Spirit, you realize that God is active and alive, present in our lives in a dynamic way. The Holy Spirit is God's love and his power working among us. Well, I would, I would describe the Holy Spirit as a person who has um, been given to us through Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, who comes into our life, who is the author of life, who sustains creation, uh, who moves in power to transform uh, humanity, uh, that the Holy Spirit gives glory and honor to God, who, and he is God, and that we pray through God to God in the power of the Holy Spirit. God has a purpose for us, and the Holy Spirit is God. God has a great plan, which is both personal and universal. God understands all the dynamics and details of our lives. He has a personal will for each one of us, and we fit into his plan for the salvation of the world. The Holy Spirit is never absent from us. Uh, we, in a certain sense, move away from God, or we say, where is God? Uh, but the Spirit is always calling us and reminding us, if, if we are baptized Christians, that we are already united to Christ through the, the Spirit today. The belief in the presence of the Holy Spirit is based on scripture, particularly in the writings of St. Paul, who wrote extensively about the Holy Spirit after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Spiritual gifts are New Testament gifts, and they are spoke about often in the New Testament. There's at least three passages in Paul where he talks about the spiritual gifts which is sometimes called the pneumatica, sometimes called the charismata in the Greek Bible. Uh, and he says that the Holy Spirit gives gifts of ministry. It's one of the ways you can see it as different from the Isaiah gifts. They're tools that different Christians have from the Holy Spirit to build up the body of Christ and to proclaim the gospel. And there are many of them. There's nine in 1 Corinthians 12, and there's five in Ephesians 4, and there's another list in Romans 12 of different things that Christians do that are not of their own making, but are workings of God working in a Christian. And they are services to the church. In Corinthians 12, speak, Paul speaks about the gifts of the Spirit. And in Ephesians, where um, Paul talks about the vision, the various services uh, that um, God is asking us to provide through being pastors, teachers, evangelists. So those are gifts of the Spirit. The Catechism of the Catholic Church identifies seven gifts of the Spirit as specified in the book of Isaiah. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. These gifts are meant to serve as a source of strength as we strive to live according to the teachings of Jesus Christ. And when fully developed, it's believed that they lead to a life filled with positive attributes, known as the fruits of the Spirit. 
The Bible says that every Christian receives different gifts for the building up of the church. So every Christian needs to discover which gifts the Spirit of God gives him or her to exercise a service for the church. Part of growing as a Christian is to discover my charisms. The fruits are, ma are manifest in our life. Um, it's love, joy, peace, gentleness, faithfulness, um, modesty, uh, chastity. So those gifts are, um, enable us to recognize that God lives within us. Because in our nature, uh, you know, as Paul said before he spoke about the gifts, we are a rebellious lot. We have envy, jealousy, uh, adultery, uh, you name it, you know, all the sins. But for those who live by the Holy Spirit, for those who are led by the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit are the opposite of that. The Catechism of the Catholic Church talks about the, the gifts of the Spirit being both, you might say, for our personal use, so that we may live more fully the life of Christ, and also uh, gifts that serve the community. Uh, so they're also meant to be gifts that we use for building up the church and the world. Uh, so we would use our wisdom and our fortitude and our understanding and our reverence for God and our piety uh, for, for, our, for our own spiritual life, but also for others in the world around us. Uh, fruits of the Holy Spirit are results of a good Christian life. You become holy. Everyone is called by the Spirit to become a holy person, to be a person of love and of joy and of generosity and control of their lives. Uh, it's similar to the teachings of Jesus. A bad tree gives bad fruit and a good tree gives a good fruit. If you're a tree and the Spirit of God is working in you, you will produce something that will help other people. So the fruits are the result of a life lived in the Spirit. Gifts are not that at all. Gifts are tools to help yourself and other people become holy. And fruits are the result of trying, of opening your life to the Spirit. When we return, we break down the seven gifts and their meaning. And later on, we delve into the mysteries of the miraculous gifts, such as the power to heal and the speaking of tongues. Don't go away. Mysteries of the Church will be right back. Welcome back to Mysteries of the Church. One of the greatest theological minds in history is that of St. Thomas Aquinas, the 13th century theologian whose writings on the seven gifts influence church doctrine to this day. In his prominent work, Summa Theologica, he breaks down and explains each gift and how they pertain to faith, beginning with wisdom. So a gift of wisdom, have you not met in your life someone who can, knows what God's ways are and can see a clear path. Uh, perhaps John Paul II had a lot of wisdom in the way he directed the church. Right? I would say that uh, wisdom is be able to see a situation and see how God is in that situation. That you would have wisdom to see beyond the circumstance what God is saying and what God is doing. And what I mean saying, it's not verbal, but what is, what is the message? And, and really, wisdom, uh, we, we want the gift of wisdom so that we can do God's will. We wouldn't be able to do that on our own. We need God to be able to do the works of God. So wisdom is necessary knowledge that we know what God wants us to do. I would look at all the gifts of saying that all of them, the purpose of all of these gifts is to do God's will. Their basic approach to it was that the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, so in other words, there's a whole, you might say, manual in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, as how one might develop the, the gift of wisdom in life. Although it's sometimes easy to confuse the two, the gift of understanding is different than the gift of wisdom. Where wisdom allows us to recognize the work of God, 
The gift of understanding gives us an appreciation to know that his works have a purpose. To understand um, that God works through all situations. Uh, and, and again, it's all, uh, again, faith, that we have faith in, in, in be able to say that I can understand something that's happening in my life, although it doesn't make much sense. I can understand it. In Romans 8, uh, 28, uh, it, it said that for those who love the Lord, all things work together for good. So if I have that knowledge that well, if I love the Lord, and for those who love the Lord, all things work together for good, that gives me an understanding that God is in all things, that God is capable and able to transform situations or transform the way I look at a situation. Uh, we would always say that if God is working in our life, it doesn't necessarily mean that our situations change, but the way we look at it changes. The gift of counsel is also known as the gift of judgment and allows us to make decisions when it comes to right and wrong. The gift of counsel, another one of the seven gifts, is uh, the ability to share, you might say, your wisdom and your understanding uh, with others. Counsel are people who have an ability to uh, speak well to other people and orient them in life. So a good spiritual director is often blessed with a good gift of counsel. Counsel would be that in, through prayer, we would ask the Lord to counsel us as to what decisions that we ought to make. How do, wh how do I understand? How do I decide? Uh, should I do this or should I do that? Uh, and I believe that God shows us through counsel. You know, everything is, is through our relationship with God. We don't separate the seven gifts from God. They all come from God. So being able to counsel not only myself in how I am to act, but to be able to counsel someone else, to be able to help someone see some, you know, whatever is in their life and whatever they may need assistance uh, to make a decision. But, but counsel is, is, is very important. When we return, we examine the remaining four gifts of fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. Mysteries of the Church will be right back. Welcome back to Mysteries of the Church. We previously talked about the gifts of wisdom, understanding and counsel, which allows us to recognize and accept the work of God and rely on His judgment. As a Christian, there may be times in our lives, for whatever reasons, where we might find it difficult to live according to our faith. That's when God desires us to gather the strength to do so through the gift of fortitude. Well, fortitude is, is staying, on, staying on track. Fortitude is seeing the goal and, and, and running toward that goal. You know, as St. Saint, Saint Paul would say, you know, that we run the race. And what is, what is the goal? The goal is Jesus, the goal. That's the, that's the crown uh, that we look for. And fortitude enables us to, uh, to go beyond the sufferings that we might endure, even to, you know, to say, I mean, how many people now in our world are, are really in a, in a place of danger, uh, that they might even be martyred because of their faith. And that gives them fortitude to be able to say, I, I, I serve Jesus, you know, he's the Lord, and come what may, I stand in that. So I'm, I, that's, it gives me strength, as I believe all the gifts are to strengthen us. Wow, fortitude, that's one of the best gifts of all, right? It's when you're strong as a Christian. And uh, well, I, I would say when I speak to confirmation candidates, of all the gifts that I most concentrate on, it's on fortitude because I think that we're all involved in a spiritual battle and we need to be strong against the forces of this world which want to create a culture of death, not a culture of life. The gift of knowledge gives us insight on the Word of God and how it applies to our daily lives. Knowledge is to know God's will, that I would know what God's will is for me in my life. Uh, that I would make decisions on knowing what God's will is for me in my life. 
again, this is the gifts uh, that strengthen us to be able to be holy, to be able to witness um, to Jesus, to witness our faith to others. And so knowledge can come in many ways, but uh, it can give me uh, another, and we could use this again in understanding, but I can have knowledge of something that I know would be harmful to me, that I know that this is, this is going to be harmful, therefore I'm not, I'm not going to venture down that road. So knowledge enables us to make good choices. And it's God, again, who gives us the, that understanding of what would be the good choice. It's scripture that gives us that understanding. It's God's word. It's, it's um, the, you know, the church's um, teaching to be able to let me see this, this, is, this is true knowledge. The gift of piety affirms our devotion to God and our desire to live according to his will. The gift of piety uh, is again a, a, a gift that is a disposition um, to uh, worship, a disposition to prayer, uh, a disposition to respect for, you might say, the sacred and the holy. Isn't piety a great gift? Uh, I watch different people walk into my church, and some people have no idea where they are. So a lot of them, they're eating, they're chewing gum. There's no sense of reverence. And then you see some people walk in and they're immediately aware of the presence of Jesus in this church. The gift of piety is a sense of reverence for the presence of God, and it would be great if more of us grew in that gift. Lastly, we have the gift of fear of the Lord, which is often misunderstood. Fear in this sense is actually awe for God and the fear of living without His grace. Fear of the Lord is, comes from love. We're not to have a, a slavery of fear. No, no, God has freed us. God has God uh, affirmed us. God, when He created us, He looked at us and He said, oh, this is good. And so, it, it's, it's a fear of wanting, of not wanting to offend God. That's what the fear is. It's, you know, when you love someone and you really care for them, you, 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 don't, want, you don't want to hurt them in any way. Uh, in fact, you want to protect them. You don't want to hurt them. You want them to, um, in fact, you want them to grow. You want them to, to grow into full stature of who they're called to be. So it's not a, a, a fear you know, of uh, trepidation, but it's a fear of, of never wanting to offend God. It doesn't mean being afraid of God. It means being in awe of God. It means being uh, overwhelmed by the majesty and the power of God. Not that you need to cringe from him, but that you need to stand in awe of him because of his greatness. And it's a good word because Sometimes we trivialize God very much and make him very small and very unpowerful, whereas there is no one as powerful as God or as majestic as God. And it's the sense that's evoked in many people by great cosmic things, like if you see a beautiful sunset or if you see, if you're on a mountain and see the majesty of the mountains, you're aware of, of, of greatness. Well, no matter how great the mountains or the sunset is, the majesty of God is greater than that, and to have a disposition of soul to be aware of God's greatness is a wonderful way to live. In addition to the seven gifts, there's also a belief that the Holy Spirit performs miracles through people. When we return, we examine what's believed to be as the miraculous gifts of the Spirit. In addition to the seven gifts of the Spirit, there is also what's known as the miraculous or charismatic gifts. There are several gifts in this category, many of which are associated with miracles, such as the power to heal and the speaking in tongues. And although there are many examples of these gifts in the Bible, there is definitely debate whether or not these gifts are available to us today. If you want to look at the gifts of the seven gifts of the Spirit, 
they all resided in Jesus. All the gifts were there, and he manifested them through his life. Um, Jesus had knowledge, and when we talk about Jesus having knowledge, we're talking about the Son of Man. You know, when Jesus came into the world, as we understand it, he became human. And in his humanity, he needed the Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit dwelt in him. And, that's, uh, and he manifested all the, of the gifts. So you would see in scripture the way that Jesus lived, the way that he taught, the way that he healed, all of that was an empowerment from the Holy Spirit. Yeah, some gifts are, are more extraordinary and more personalized. You know, not that many people are gifted with the gift of inspired preaching, or good preaching. But many people can pray in tongues. Many people can sing in an inspired way. So some gifts are more common than others, no doubt. Well, the, the Holy Spirit will guide every person who he has gifted uh, to use the gifts for his purpose. Um, you know, we, we, we use the gifts to glorify God because they're not for our own, you know. They, they, what the gifts really do is bring about uh, the upbuilding of the church. Uh, if, if you would know that, uh, the, that a person next to you has a gift, of healing, of miracles, has a gift of wisdom. Well, what does that do? It builds up your faith, that you know that God is real, that God moves among us, that God is, God is alive among us, and he leads us, you know, again, to do God's will. You know, what is God's will? That all of his children be saved, that all of us live a joy-filled life, that we have peace in our life. In fact, it's the gifts of the, of the fruits of the Spirit. Out of all the miraculous gifts, perhaps the most mysterious is the speaking in tongues, the ability to suddenly speak in a holy language that is not of this earth. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, if I pray with the gift of tongue of men or of angels, meaning Paul believed that the gift of tongues could be regular human languages of men, or it could be languages that are not even known on earth of angels. So uh, that's what the gift of tongues is. It's not ecstatic, meaning that you don't lose consciousness. It's not like the Holy Spirit takes over your body and you can't help but speak in tongues and are forced. God's gifts are gifts and must always be used and accepted according to your will so that you can pray in tongues whenever you want if you have the gift. Sometimes God moves you to use the gift of tongues but it's not a takeover, a possession, it's an invitation. In the New Testament, when uh, they talk about the gift of tongues, uh, always with it uh, had to come the gift of interpretation of tongues. So you might say that particular gift is always a, a dual gift because it, it doesn't do the community any good for someone to be speaking in an unintelligible language if no one's there to interpret it. When we consider the gifts of the Spirit, we must remember that they are just that, gifts. They are given to us as an expression of God's love. And although we may not fully understand his work, the gifts of the Spirit allow us to trust in infinite wisdom. Thank you for watching. I'm Carolyn Morrison, and I hope to see you next time on Mysteries of the Church.